Hi, Alex Habrock here. Tyler Cowan and I are the authors of Modern Principles, Macroeconomics. And today we're going to be talking about the dynamic ADAS model, which is new to that book. Our goals in writing Modern Principles, Macroeconomics was to make a Principles of Macroeconomics book, which was both modern, but also simpler to teach. From the modern point of view, business fluctuations are fluctuations in growth rates around a long-term trend. This actually makes things simpler because there's no switching in the modern principles between growth rates and GDP levels. Growth theory we can think of as long-run growth. Business fluctuations we can think of as short-run growth. This means there's a continuity between growth theory and business fluctuations because everything is done in terms of growth rates. When we come to model business fluctuations, we're going to use insights from two different models. We're going to use insights from real business cycle models and also from New Keynesian models. We're going to combine these insights into a dynamic ADAS model. In terms of a picture, we can see that economic growth is not smooth. If we want to focus on the long-term trend, then we can use something like a solo model. If we're more interested in looking at fluctuations, then we're going to use our dynamic ADAS model, which is based upon RBC and New Keynesian insights. By now, you may be wondering whether real business cycles and New Keynesian models aren't too difficult for the principal's student. Not at all. Let's demonstrate using our very simple RBC model. On the right panel, we have the inflation rate on the vertical axis and the growth rate of real GDP on the horizontal axis. What we call the solo growth curve is vertical in inflation growth rate space because the potential growth rate does not depend upon the inflation rate. It only depends upon the levels of capital and labor and technology, institutions, and so forth. A positive real shock will shift the solar growth curve to the right. A negative real shock will shift the solar growth curve to the left. Let's take a look at that in action. A positive shock increases the growth rate, as you can see in the left panel. As the economy is subject to a series of shocks, the growth rate increases and decreases tracing out a dynamic path over time, which looks like real data. Let's show how the RBC model works in a real economy. India's economy is subject to shocks from the weather, in particular from rainfall shocks. In the left panel, we show how rainfall shocks influence the growth rate of India's agricultural output. A positive rainfall shock increases the growth rate. A negative rainfall shock decreases the growth rate of India's agricultural output. Not surprisingly, since India is a predominantly agricultural economy, rainfall shocks also translate directly into growth shocks to India's GDP. So in the right panel, we show how a positive rainfall shock increases India's growth rate. A negative rainfall sh shock decreases India's growth rate. Real shocks are easy to see in India's agricultural economy and are very intuitive. But they also influence developed economies. We talk more about that in the book. Okay, now that we've covered real business cycles, let's turn to aggregate demand. We want to create a simple model of aggregate demand, so we're going to build on what students know already by using the same model as we use for inflation namely the quantity theory. We can write the quantity theory in growth or dynamic terms as the money growth rate plus velocity growth equals growth in prices plus growth in real GDP, where we've used an arrow to indicate growth rates. Rewriting this slightly, we have that M plus V is equal to inflation plus real growth. Now let's rearrange this, putting inflation on one side and everything else on the other side. Now we have a simple aggregate demand model, which says that inflation is equal to nominal spending growth minus the real growth rate. So for example, 
If nominal spending is growing at 10% and the real growth rate is 4%, the inflation rate must be 6%. Let's take a look at this on a graph. Once again, we have the inflation rate on the vertical axis and the growth rate of real GDP on the horizontal axis. Our aggregate demand curve is then a straight line with a slope of negative 1, and it can be read as follows. Imagine, for example, that nominal spending is growing at 5%, and the real growth rate is 3%. As a result, the inflation rate must be 2%. Similarly, if the nominal spending is growing at 5%, and the real GDP growth rate is 0%, the inflation rate must be 5%. So the aggregate demand curve gives us all the combinations of inflation and real growth which are consistent with a given level of nominal spending growth. An increase in aggregate demand is simply a shift out of the curve. Okay, let's show now how long-run dynamic equilibrium is much easier to understand in inflation growth space than it is in price level space. Here, using a graph from another famous textbook, is long-run dynamic equilibrium in price level space. As you can see, there are one, two, three, four, five, six curves. There are many labels. It's really quite difficult to understand. Now, here is long-run dynamic equilibrium in inflation growth rate space. Imagine that nominal spending is growing at a rate of 10% per year, and that the solo growth curve is at its normal level of 3% per year. As a result, the inflation rate is 7% per year. This is very clean and easy to understand. To complete our model, we introduce the short-run aggregate supply curve. This is a upward-sloped curve for the usual New Keynesian reasons, that is, sticky prices and sticky wages. If nominal spending is growing at 5%, the solo growth curve is at 3%, then the inflation rate is at 2%. Each short-run aggregate supply curve is written for a given level of expected inflation. Since we're in a long-run dynamic equilibrium, the expected rate of inflation in this graph is 2%. It's easiest to understand how this model works with an example, so let's do that. Let's look at what happens when the money growth rate increases, beginning from a long-run dynamic equilibrium. So our solo growth curve is at 3%. The nominal spending is growing at a rate of 5%. Inflation is 2%. And of course, the short-run aggregate supply curve is ridden with an expected inflation rate of 2%. Now the money supply increases unexpectedly. This shifts out the aggregate demand curve. Since the increase is unexpected, the short-run growth rate of real GDP increases, as does the inflation rate. Notice that the growth rate of the money supply has increased by 5%. Three percentage points have gone into the short-run growth rate, and two percentage points have gone into the inflation rate. As always, there's an adding up constraint. Well, what happens in the long run? In the long run, Unexpected inflation always becomes expected inflation. So the short-run aggregate supply curve shifts up, moving us to a new equilibrium at point C. At point C, nominal spending is now growing at 10%. We're back on the solo growth curve because that curve gives us the potential growth rate of an economy at 3%. And of course, inflation is then 7%. And expected inflation is 7%. So we're back to long-run equilibrium. In many ways, this is very similar to the analysis in price level space. Now we're just doing it in inflation growth rate space.